Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today, um, last class we were talking about statistical distributions. Um, I'd like to finish our, you know, let's say, blitz statistic chapter by talking today about statistical significance, including permutation tests, which I know some people have been asking me about with respect to the uh, assignment and stuff. So what is there about st statistics? Um, Historically, that the st if you said where on campus were the people that studied data, that was the statistics department. And every, de every you know, reasonable university has a statistics department, or at least a section of a department that's devoted to statistics. And one of their primary concerns was always has to do with statistical significance testing. Giving an observation, is it really meaningful? Is it supported? Okay, you want to try to prove, does this data prove what you think it is doing? Now, computer scientists, you know, I'll put data miners in this category, historically like doing experiments and building a machine learning program or something like that. And, um, you know, want the, their thing to be cool at the end. Kind of historically, um, you know, if you give people, a computer scientists, a bunch of data, historically they will find something in it, some pattern in there that they find interesting. Now, the question of whether that is a meaningful pattern is a separate question often. And so the questions of whether patterns are meaningful tend to be a statistic, you know, the kind of tools statisticians deal with. Whether, you know, finding cool things from data is probably more akin to the kind of stuff that we do in here. But it's important to think like a statistician on some level, to know when things are, you observe something when it's real and when it's not real. Okay, any questions about that? Again, you know, culturally I've had, you know, statisticians think differently than I do, okay? And, uh, you know, they, they, they know about things that I don't know about. But, um, but historically I guess, the, you know, again, quite often when you're working, a computer scientist working with data, Usually things are kind of obvious, often you feel things are obvious whether something is meaningful or not. Often you're wrong. And that's why we're going to talk here about statistical significance testing. Any questions? Okay. So, um, you know, again, what do, we, what do we know about in here? In here you guys know something about taking a data set. You know about, um, what you call it, taking two variables and seeing if there's a correlation. And you know that a bigger correlation is better than a smaller correlation. But the question of whether or not you, when you see a, a correlation, when you see a pattern, is it a meaningful pattern, okay? You know, we should have some way of arguing that it's meaningful, okay? And it's not just that the correlation is high, okay? We need some kind of a proof that the, the article, you know, that, that this kind of pattern, how likely was it we saw something like this by chance? And that's kind of what's going to, what motivates our statistical significance testing. Okay, any questions? Now the world that I picture statisticians as his traditionally living in is a small data world where data is precious and um, important decisions are to be made. Okay, so the classic example of where you need statisticians in the world is in medical statistics. So you, let's say you have, you know, a particular type of drug and let's say that, you know, you run this a drug trial and you feed the patients, you have 34 patients, you feed them tr drug A and 19 of them get better, okay? You, you take 21 of them, you feed them drug B and 14 of them get better. Is drug A better than B or is drug A not better than B, okay? That's the kind of a question that is historically, you know, I would say is a classical statistics kind of a world, okay? It seems like an important question to know the answer to because lives are at stake. It's hard to get a lot more data because you have to sacrifice another patient every time you, you, to get another data point, okay? And um, the question is kind of subtle here. It's obvious that here you cured 14 out of 21 patients. That would be an argument that two-thirds of the patients got cured here. A little bit more than a half of the patients got cured here. The question is, is drug B better than drug A? Okay, and what's the likelihood that kind of a difference could be due to chance? Okay, that's the kind of thing that uh, normally we're worried about. And again, these are important issues, okay, because 
you know, with respect to drug approval, it's kind of interesting. Whenever they announce the results of a drug trial, you sometimes hear in the news that, uh, you know, this drug trial for this promising um, Alzheimer's disease drug failed that, that today. It's always fun to then go and watch the stock of the company whose, whose, whose drug trial failed. Because these drug companies typically have a small number of drugs. If it passes the drug trial, people will pay them billions. If it fails, you can't sell the drug, and it's worth nothing. And so it's always fun to watch. So, so again, the, these things, getting these things right are important, and that's why you have statisticians. Any questions? Okay. Now, um, in our case, like I said, when I, when I think about it in this class, at some point on your project, one, th one sin that I imagine many of you are going to commit is you're going to have a training data, you're going to have something you're going to be looking at. A, you have a training data, you have a, um, what you call it, uh, a variable, you're trying to build a regression to predict that variable. You're going to try three or four different methods. One of them is going to do slightly better at, let's say, classification than the others. Okay, and you'll proudly bear that to me and say, look, this was the best model. The question of whether or not one model that classified 86.2% of the things right is really a better model than a question that mo model that classified 84.3% of the things right. Okay, these are very similar kinds of questions. Okay, and it's for these kind of reasons why we care about statistical significance testing. Any questions? Okay, good. So let me talk in here. What I'm going to try to do today is to talk about two types of statistical tests, uh, classical statistical tests. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what you call it, the um, permutation testing, which is kind of a way to maybe avoid some of the subtleties of these statistical tests. But OK, so how many of you ever heard of t-tests before? Okay, any of you ever, any, how many of you have ever had any statistics in a, in a previous class? How many people had probability in a previous class? Okay, and did any of you call your courses probability and statistics? Okay, then maybe you had some statistics in there. But, um, but basically, um, what, what, the, what, what there are, there are a bunch of different statistical tests that, that try to get at the idea of, st of significance. And... The t-test is one that, given two different samples of population, okay, tries to tell whether or not the populations they're sampled from are different. Okay? So suppose, let's say, I took 20 men, okay, and I, computed, I randomly sample 20 men, and I get their IQs. And I randomly sample 20 women, and I get their IQs. Okay? If I take the averages of these samples, what's going to happen? You say the men will be lower, okay? What I can absolutely guarantee is they probably won't be the same, okay? One of them is going to be bigger than the other, right? And so the classic computer science move would be to say, which has the higher average? This average is slightly higher than that. Make a sweeping statement that this gender is smarter than the other gender, okay? The real question is, is there a difference between the two means that are meaningful? Okay, that's the kind of a question that we would like to get at with a t-test. Okay, the two populations, we take the samples, they will have different means. Is the difference meaningful? Okay, any questions? And if we think a little bit about why, to try to drive why these tests work or what the phenomena is. Suppose, let's say, that we have two different distributions. X is our random variable, perhaps it is IQ, perhaps it is height, whatever it is, and we have two different populations here, okay? For there to be a meaningful difference, we want to be able to tell that if, if, if we, we're, you know, we, we're drawing samples from each distribution, we want to try to tell whether or not these distributions are different from each other. Is the pink distribution different than the, red, than the, than the, the blue distribution based on a certain number of random samples from it? What should be clear is that as the mean of the distributions gets further apart, the top ones, I'm showing two normal distributions, which have the same mean, have different mean, the, 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 um, 
the same standard deviation, but the means are different. The distance between the means increases. It should be clear that the further the means are apart, the easier it is to tell the two different distributions. Does everybody agree? If one of these was men and one of these was women, and if it was IQ, okay, it would be clear that kind of with a small number of samples, I would have a, a much easier time telling that uh, the average of one group was different than the average of the other group, okay? Because the further the means are apart, the easier it is to tell. The figures on the bottom show two distributions where the, 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 the distance between the mean is the same, but the variance of each distribution is different, okay? Or the standard deviations are different. Which distributions are easier to tell apart? Okay, when the standard when, the, when the, the standard deviation is high or when the standard deviation is low? It is easier to tell apart when the standard deviation was low. Think about the limiting case. If uh, there was zero standard deviation, then all of the pink things or the, the red things would have this score, and all of the blue things would have the mean score. Is that right? And then it would be pretty easy to tell. So part of telling whether a, a difference between means is significant is not only what is the um, what you call it, what is the mean of the, the difference between the means, but how much standard what what the, how much variance there is in each population. Any questions about that? That should be convincing. So what is a t test? A t test is the classical statistical test which basically says that two t means, if you have two populations and they have means, they are going to differ significantly if the difference between the means is relatively large, okay? Uh, the standard deviations are relatively small, right? The smaller the standard deviations, the more confident we are at separating these two. And that there are enough samples, right? The more samples we have from each distribution, the more likely we are to be able to tell if we have, you know, if you told me you had 20 men and 20 women and you did the IQ test. If you did the same thing on a million men and a million women, you would feel much more confident about your, uh, your conclusions, okay? So the way a t-test works, and there's several different variations of t-tests, but basically the idea is you compute a statistic something like this, which is something here in this case, if I have two data sets, I take the difference of the means of the, them and divide that by the square root of basically the squares of the standard deviations of each sample, right? So again, if the difference is big between the means, the t is going to be large, right? If the standard deviations are small, if sigma is zero, I'm dividing by infinite, it, by, by, dividing by zero, dividing by zero makes something large, right? So if the standard deviation is small, then um, this makes a big number here. And likewise, if I put, have a very, very large value of n, that in this model will contribute to having more, more confidence here. Any questions? So it should be, yeah. Yes. But can there be like mod of like one mean one What? In the numerator, absolute, like absolute. Uh, um, do I want the absolute value here? Um, presumably the absolute value is what I want, right? I mean, again, you know, it's a question of are we caring about are the means different? And it doesn't matter whether, you know, the big one is first or the second one is first, right? The real question is are they different? So an absolute value is presumably the right thing here, okay? Any questions? So what you do is, you com the way a t-test works is that you compute the, um, what you call it? You compute this statistic. You take your two sets of samples, okay? You compute this statistic, and then you look for the value of, of t, you look it up in a table, and that's going to give you a p-value a probability in some sense that this much of a difference in mean could have been a comp com about purely by sampling chance. 
Okay? Any questions about it? Okay? Actually, you know, sampling things come up, um, you know, bounds on sampling are, you probably hear them in the news a lot these days. Does anybody know why, anybody watching the news, why do they, do they talk about how accurate certain sa sampling procedures are these days in the news a lot? Election. You hear about the election polls, right? And what do they do? Okay, let's think what they're kind of doing. It. You know, if, you, if you read about what they're doing, they're saying, um, I had, um, what you call it, I, I, I did this test and Clinton came up, uh, was chosen by 48% and Trump was chosen by 44%. And this poll has an error of plus or minus 3% or something like that, right? What that's saying is that because we sampled a certain number of people, the more people you sample, the more accurate your um, bound on this, th th this, this probability is, right? We're going to have an election, mercifully, in uh, a few weeks, right? And then we're going to sample everybody, and then we're going to get the right answer, right? The question now is, if you think about it, when you're... When they talk about the sampling error, if there really are this many, you know, a certain number of people who favor one over the other, when I pick people at random, I might get unlucky and pick more people from the, 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 the unpopular one, right? But you should be able to know that if there is a certain level, you know, at least a certain observed difference, the probability, you can kind of figure out, that you can kind of compute what's the probability I oversampled the, the, the smaller number by so many, num so many to make this unlikely. That's kind of the idea that's going to drive what makes these statistical tests work. Yeah? You know, um, let, let's say I don't know, okay? The, I, I, to, to, to precise, the answer is one of those, okay? And, um, you know, the, the details matter here. Again, with a lot of these statistical kind of tests, the details matter. Remember, let's go back to our case with the drug testing, okay? Getting the details right there matter, okay? But another way to think about it, if you wish, is a little bit like, Suppose it was a 50-50, if I think about with the, the election polling thing. The analogy that I have here is suppose, let's say, it was a 50-50 thing where everybody cared for each candidate equally, okay? What's the likelihood we would see, um, what you call it, uh, one, if we did a certain number of samples, what's the likelihood we would see more votes for one than the other? And if you think about it, that's a lot like the question of, if I flip a coin n times, what's the number of times I get, how many, what's the likelihood I'm going to get more, a certain amount more heads than tails, okay? And so you can now kind of start to think about how do you get these kind of bounds from thinking about it from that, you know, that, that coin flipping model. You know, you can know how, what's the likelihood we're going to be a certain number of standard deviations from the expectation, right? And so it's similar kind of math that goes on into analyzing those confidence bounds, okay? Any questions about it? Okay, fair enough. So basically, the argument that I'd like to say, what I find with these statistical significance tests like t-test, did anybody ever done a t-test before? One person, okay? So your statistics, probably in statistics class, didn't have very much statistics, okay? But typically the way these things are done is you compute that statistic and then you look up in a table to see whether or not um, what the, oh, 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 we had 96 degrees of freedom and the T statistic was 33.2. Therefore, with probability, the P value, the probability that, that there's a difference is 0 0.001, okay? Now, I find these kind of tests very opaque because God knows where, how the table was computed. I find you kind of lose track of what was the underlying mathematics behind it. But again, I, the way I think about it is a lot of where these results come from 
They have to do with what's the probability you get unlucky in randomly sampling something, okay? If they were, in fact, the means of these two thing group populations were the same, what's the, likely, the likelihood that you, 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 got, uh, you sampled one disproportionately from one side, okay, so much as to skew the average, okay? And so that's the kind of the ideas behind it. I'm not going to go try to prove these things, but that's basically where these kind of sampling tests come from. Any questions? Okay, so if you have two means and you want to prove there's a me meaningful difference, a t-test is a reasonable thing. Any questions? So is this uh, something kind of like LFI in the table of like, you can check whether with 5% error rate? Like right, so typically what these tables look like, again, there is a statistic that you're looking at, you, you know, you have a number of degrees of freedom, you have an assumed alpha, meaning what is the light, you know, what, what is the, value of the statistic that you need in order to be with a 1 20th probability that this did not happen by chance, okay? And then you look it up and you get something, okay? Any questions? What do you mean by degrees of freedom? Degrees of freedom basically are n, the number of elements in the data, okay? I, typically, I think it's typically like one less than that. But it's basically a function of, again, if you think what we need to know, we need to know what the number of uh, samples we basically have. Again, these, you know, you, the reason people have statistics classes is because you do have to get these details right, okay? But basically, you, you parameterize it by essentially the number of um, data points. You parameterize it. You have a t value of your the value of your statistic, and you then look up to get a sense of what your confidence value in it is or is not, okay? Any questions? Okay. So that is one type of statistics test that you should know about if you want to tell means of distributions. There's another type of statistics test, formal statistics test, that I kind of like a little bit better, okay, or I, I have found more useful in what I do. Has, it's something called the kolmogorov smirnov test, which is a way of telling whether two samples are drawn from the same distribution. So let's think back to our, we, we, we sampled a bunch of men, their I, we had a bunch of men, we got their IQs, we have the women, we got their IQs. Were the men and women really drawn from the same distribution underlying it? Or is it that one gender is smarter than the other? Okay? So the way that the Kolmogorov smirnov or KS test works is we, we build a cumulative distribution function on our sample. Okay? So let's say that we had IQ, and again, if the x-axis here was IQ, 100 would be the mean, right? And, uh, you know, basically uh, everyone in here is probably above a 70, and, uh, you know, probably below a one-third, well, we'll see, okay? But you can imagine now that we build a cumulative distribution function where we sort, let's say, all the men by their IQ, okay? and um, we would now have a function that says, here's the number of men with an IQ less than, or e greater, less than or equal to this, right? That's what the cumulative distribution functions are. So we build the cumulative distribution function for the men. We build the cumulative distribution function for the women, right? Does everybody, do people see what I'm doing now? Okay. Now, the question is, if these two were drawn from the po same population, we would expect that the curve should look pretty similar, right? So what we're going to do is instead find what is the value of x where the distance between these curves, what is the IQ where the fraction of men less than or equal to this differs more than the fraction of women less than or equal to this, right? And the claim is that the size of that gap has to do with the likelihood that these two are drawn from the same distribution. If they are drawn from the same distribution, we would expect that maximum gap to be relatively small as opposed to if they were drawn from a different distribution. Does everybody see that? So basically what they do is we figure out the size of that gap and we then compute, uh, we claim that the size of that gap, okay, is going to be significant 
Okay, the, the, there's a, 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 the probability that there is a real difference between the populations, okay, is significant to a value of alpha, meaning the probability of it happening by chance is less than, you know, alpha, okay, is going to be, it's a square, this function that's a square root of the sizes of the two sets of samples, and there's this number you're looking up in a table, C of alpha, that tells us what the coefficient of this is. So if the gap is bigger than this, okay, then we say the populations differ. And if not, they are, uh, you know, they, they are presumably the same within a factor of alpha. Yeah? Well, okay, so we don't expect it to be a perfect difference. We don't expect a zero difference. But if you think about what a gap here means, the gap is a, you know, this is, the difference between here and here is a fraction of the number of elements being different, right? So a big gap is a relatively robust thing because it means that there's a lot of elements behaving differently, right? If you look, look at what this thing is doing. This is saying that if you have a relatively big gap at this point, 20% of the elements of the men and the women are doing differently. Does everybody agree with that? So, so, so in fact, it's a relatively robust thing. It looks like, oh, it's only one point. But it's a point that, that, that involves a certain number of elements. Okay? Yeah. No, no, what it means is either we live in a world where everybody is a person and IQs of people are distributed like this, okay? And there's no difference in IQs between men and women, okay? If you look at the distribution of men, it would look like this. And if you looked at the distribution of women, it would look like this, okay? So there's an underlying population. Either they, they are both drawn from the same population or they're not. That's kind of what you're trying to figure out. If there is a meaningful difference between the IQs of men and women, then they would be drawn from different populations, right? The, you know, the distribution for the men, the real distribution from the men is different than the real distribution for women. That's what the quest statement means. And, or it could be they're drawn from the same distribution. And we would like to say, what is the likelihood they were drawn from the same distribution? Okay, and if they were drawn from the same distribution, the CDFs of each of the samples shouldn't be that different from each other. That's kind of what the intuition is here. And there's a way to quantify what the meaningfulness of that is. Any questions? So what do I like about this test right off the bat? Okay, I like the fact that instead of just getting a number back, yes or no, there's a difference, I get a picture, okay? And I get to see how big a difference is there between the distributions, right? I mean, ultimately, the, you know, I also get a number based on what, what that difference is. But it lets me see where are the distributions differing if, in fact, we're deciding they're not the same, okay? Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, again, what we're trying to do is prove whether or not two things were drawn from different distributions. And if you want to say what's good about this is, if you want to say, was one of the samples, is, one, is a sample drawn from a normal distribution, that is a special case of this, because you could construct one of these distributions by random sampling. Suppose I get a bunch of data, I, I sample data, and I want to know, did it really come from a normal distribution, right? We know what a normal distribution is, right? It's this, you know, there's a mean, there's a mu, there's a standard deviation, right? Okay. And either there's a meaningful difference or there isn't. I mean, either, either, you know, certain, dis you know, our, our data might come from a normal distribution or it might not. How can we tell? Well, one thing we could do is take a bunch of points and randomly sample them from a normal distribution. 
So we agree that the normal distribution is a mathematical thing, right? If I wanted, there, there's ways to get 100 points. And I'll even show you a little bit later how you do it. But it should be clear that for any mathematical distribution you can define, you can build a random number generator to generate numbers from that distribution. Now, if I really wanted to know, I took a bunch of um, IQs and I want to know whether or not they're normally distributed, how could I tell? Well, what if I did the KS test where one of the distributions were the IQs and the others were a sample randomly drawn from the normal distribution? This I know is the normal, came from the normal distribution because I sampled it explicitly, right? The IQs, I want to know, did they come from the same, from a normal distribution? If they also came from a normal distribution, then the KS test would say there shouldn't be a difference between those two samples. Is that right? So does everybody see that I could do this on a two, you know, the KS test as a two sample thing? Okay, is this popular distribution the same as that one? Or I can ask you, is, does this stuff come from a this sample, statistical sample that I have, come from a real distribution that I know? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that would be a logical thing to say. say I, I would, I would, I would, if, if I took the, I observed a bunch of IQs, I find what was the mean, what was the standard deviation. I want to ask, were these normally distributed? They look sort of bell-shaped. But how would I know? I am now going to sample from a standard, a, a normal distribution of that same size, of that same parameters, and then ask whether or not the samples that were drawn from the provable normal distribution, are they indistinguishable from the samples that were drawn from the IQ. Okay? Any questions about that? People see how that works? So here I did a little experiment. So here I had um, a sample, okay, that I thought was normally distributed, or it was, it was supposed to be bell-shaped. I don't know if it was IQ or something like that. It was probably height, if I had to take a guess. I think it was, I think it was height, okay? But I, I compared it to a random sample from a uniform distribution. Look at this one. Which is the uniform distribution based on this cumulative thing? And which is the normal distribution on the left? Which color is, is what was, was the artificial sample from the uniform distribution? And which was my presumed real data that's probably measuring height or something, yeah? Blue is uniform. Does everybody see that? And when I do this, I say, hey, look, there's a pretty big difference over here, right? On the right side, I compared a random sample from, a, from you know, my, uh, actually here the blue is, I, I, my blue line here is I think the same as the red line here, okay? But here I, I sam compare it to a sample drawn from the normal distribution. And as you can see, the biggest deviation is a lot smaller. Any questions? Okay, so what's good about this KS test is I, I get a picture and I also get a way to tell whether something comes from a distribution I think it does or whether two things come from the same distribution. Any questions about that? Yeah. Well, so the threshold is kind of pops out of these equations, okay? So we agree that, right, the measured thing, this DNN, is this thing, okay? It's the biggest, the place where there's the biggest difference between the two. And we're really saying is that there is a significant difference if that distance is greater than something here that's basically square root the number of points, okay, times some constant, which is a function of the significance level we want it to achieve. What's the light probability this happened by chance? Okay. We look this up in a tech, in a table. We have a desired alpha. We look this thing up in a table, and then we can tell whether our difference is big enough to be meaningful or not. Any questions about that? Okay. So 
That is the KS test, and this is I, I think this is a test that I, that I am reasonably satisfied with. Any questions about this? Okay. People understand where this one comes from. Okay. There is another issue that comes up in statistical statistics. So now you should say, yes, I now see a way, see that there is a um, need to uh, tell, test whether or not something is significant. Um, one thing to note is that when we talk about a significance level, when I want to tell whether two distributions are the same or uh, whether or not uh, one mean is bigger than the other, you know, a common convention for what is the significance level is 0 0.05, which means is there a 1 in 20 chance this could have happened by accident, right? If there's more than a 1 in 20 chance that it happened by accident, it's probably not meaningful. That's kind of a convention, that 1 in 20 is a common number, okay? Sometimes people say it's significant to the 0 0.01 level. That's a 1 in 100 chance of it being significant, happening by accident. Okay? And these are common conventions that people use to tell whether something is significant, right? Now, notice, however, if you do a fishing test where you compare lots of pairs of things together looking for a high correlation, you are going to find it. Remember our butter production in Bangladesh argument? Here was another one that I saw, There's a, uh, which I cite in the textbook. This is a comparison of the total am amount of money spent at video game arcades and the number of PhDs granted in computer science each year. And as you look at that, there is a dramatic, you know, it's very, very similar functions, right? Okay? Now, what do we conclude from this? Okay? If we, you know, if, you know, if we did a statistical test here, does that, does that look like that kind of a correlation could happen by chance with a probability of 1 in 20? I'd say almost certainly not, right? Does that mean that the arcade money to CSPHD relationship is real? The answer is no. Now, why not? Okay, and it has to do with not really how good is that match, but how was the match obtained? This is kind of an important thing. If there's a, I am counting as significant the fact that there is a 1 in 20 chance, okay, that, that, that this good a correlation happened by accident. If I compare millions of things against millions of things, am I going to have pairs of things that correlate, that, 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 that have a correlation that, that, that should happen by chance less than 1 in 20? Certainly, 1 20th of all my pairs should have that property. Does everybody see that? So it is, you know, a, a, a dishonest or thing is to sort of do a thing where you try lots and lots of hypothesis tests, okay? Pick the best one, the one that came up the best, and say, look, it's significant to a high level, okay? We have to be honest and kind of correct for the fact that we did millions of tests coming up with this. Does everybody kind of see it? If you had done only one test, if someone had woken up in the middle of the night and said, you know, the reason when everybody who, 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 who goes for a PhD spend computer science spends a lot of time playing video games, there's got to be a correlation between the amount of money spent there. If they then went and got those numbers and did a correlation, they, they show you the significance, the chance of this happening is 0 .001. Should they go publish a paper? They are allowed to publish a paper saying, I proved it. But if you did a million of these tests, okay, you're not allowed to say that, okay? Because the probability is it could have, you know, something is going to achieve that amount is going to happen by chance is very, very high. So what they do is something called the Bonferrani correction, okay? Which says that if you are testing N hypotheses, and you want to be impressed if one arises to a significance level of alpha. It's really the same. You have to make sure that one of them, unfortunately, you can't see because the number is shifted. But this is the number alpha over n. So if, let's say, I, I am going to be happy if, there's a, if I prove something with a 1 20th chance of happening by accident, 
If I do a million of these things, okay, I've, it's, it's, I've got to make sure and for me to be impressed by one of them, okay, it's got to be significant to the level of 0 0.05 divided by a million. Does everybody see that? So I, I will, if you're doing millions of tests, you're only impressed if one of them matches the higher level here. Any questions about that? Okay. So this is a common level, a, a common, let's say, sin mistake that you guys will may do in this class. You guys are going to be trying to prove that one thing reflects another. Okay. You're going to do an experiment and it fails. You do another experiment and it fails. You do another experiment and it fails. You do another experiment and it fails. Do another exp do another experiment and it comes up with that, that the likelihood that it happened by chance was less than 1 20th. You start bragging, right? And that's not, uh, that's not kosher then. Any questions? Actually, one thing that, 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 that somebody did to um, prove this a little, okay, again, there's a lot of questions in science these days, in real science. There's a lot of concern about whether results that get published in the literature are reproducible, meaning that they're really phenomena that you would expect to see. And one thing that they did is somebody did, an ex did a study where they plotted for every paper where they had a significance value, okay, how many significance values were there at the level of 0 .0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, you would expect that, okay, um, in some sense the numbers should be uniformly distributed in this range, just because of how statistical tests work. But there's a lot more, let's say, statistic confidences that come in just above, just slightly better than 0 0.05, than there should be. And the reason is because people are presumably doing their experiments until they get something that is significant, and then they stop and report it. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about the idea of the Bonferrani hypothesis uh, correction and why we need that as testing? Yeah. So again, if you you know if you're Trying to brag about how good some a, a, a how likely it was that something happened by chance. If you if you're given a data, if you have a variable you care about, you know a dependent variable, and you have a bunch of independent variables. When you say what's the likelihood that this particular variable would correlate so highly by chance? That's different than the question of what's the likelihood that if I'm given 10 variables in my data set, at least one of them will correlate with this. That's really kind of the issue that we're getting at here, right? So if you give me enough different variables in your data set, something is going to correlate with it, like butter production in Bangladesh and the, the, the price of the stock market. So if you're going to try to say, gee, this correlation, this variable is significant, it's not enough to say that the correlation was, you know, above, you know, could not have happened by chance with a probability of less than 1 in 20. You would need to, in order to convince me of it, you would have to divide it by the number of variables you tried. Okay? Any questions? Okay? So keep that in mind as a statistical sin people can do. So, so basically, what you want is it's a if you think of this alpha here is the threshold you're deciding in advance where you're going to be impressed with if the correlation is at least this good in some sense, right? And if you're doing one correlation, if the likelihood that a correlation that high came in was um, less than 5%, you would say, yeah, that's probably a meaningful correlation. Okay, but if you're doing a lot of different correlation tests and one twentieth of them come above this level, most likely none of those variables are meaningful. Do you see, see what I mean? Okay, because the, the likelihood that if I had a random variable, it, it, it scored as well as one out of 20 random variables, 
should happen one out of 20, one, one twentieth of the time. So if I am going to have a, if I've decided that I want this, this level of confidence and I want it to, for, for a correlation to be meaningful and I'm going to perform n such tests, what I really want is my p value has to be less than or equal to alpha over n instead of just alpha. Okay, if I'm only doing one test, alpha over one is alpha, right? If I am doing ten tests, okay, suddenly, if I don't have one of my variables doesn't correlate to the level that this much correlation couldn't happen by chance, presumably none of the variables correlate meaningfully with my data. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions about it? Okay, so the main thing is to take away is the fact that the world is different if you're doing many tests and you have to correct for that. Any questions? And going back and doing it a second time is kind of like another test. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. Okay, fair enough. So, again, the important point is that if you have small, okay, any questions here? Okay. So significance tells us what is the likelihood that the distributions are different, okay? What, 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 is, what is the likelihood that the difference between these distributions um, was, you know, uh, not a function of chance, that there really is a difference between the two distributions? Now, one thing to note is that, um, that if you have large enough sample sizes, you can probably prove that even very, very small differences between distributions couldn't happen by chance. Does everybody believe, let's go back to our IQ testing thing. If we did our t-test, we had our IQ test. Suppose, let's say, um, what do you call it? I had a million men and a million women, and I got their IQs, and I computed the difference between the IQs was 0 0.01, okay? If I have enough men and enough women in the study, probably that that big a difference is going to be unlikely to happen by chance. Does everybody get that idea? Now, the question is, significance tests deal with how likely was it that something happened, the difference is explained by chance. Often, there can be a real difference between distributions. But the distribution, the difference isn't enough to be really important. Suppose, let's say, we were to figure out that there was a difference of, on average, in IQ between men and women, a 0.1 difference, okay? That one gender had an IQ, average IQ of 100, and the other one had an average IQ of 100.1, okay? That might be statistically significant. The question is, is it important? Okay, should I now decide to admit people of only one gender, for example? Okay, whoever the winning gender is. Okay? Does everybody see, again, the distinction I want to make is, significance is the confidence that the observed difference is real. The notion of an effect size is a, is a notion that the difference that we're seeing here is important. Okay, and they are different things. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so recognize that what we typically the way that we would want to work with is first we observe a difference. Is that difference meaningful? Is that difference significant? If it's not statistically significant, then we won't care about it because it's not real. Okay. If it is statistically significant, the question is, is it enough that we can use it to make serious predictions on? And that gets into a more a question, an issue of things like effect size. And there are different measures, again, of how strong the effect is, how strong the um, predictive power of the variable is, okay? Things like correlation coefficient and the overlap size between distributions. But for now, just, re just accept it, rem accept it make, be sure you understand the difference between significance, which is the probability that it happened by 
uh, chance and importance, which is that the difference is meaningful enough to be used for predictions and stuff like that. Any questions about that? Okay, any questions? Okay. Now, one way to get these confidence levels or p-values that people talk about uh, between whether something is a real phenomena or not are to use these statistical tests like the t-test and the ks test. Um, you know, learning how to use them requires a statistics course or reading very carefully. There's all kinds of, of subtleties about what, what do you assume about the distribution and what is your hypothesis and is it a one-sided test or a two-sided test? The way that in data science people more often d establish some kind of, con of confidence about things because it's sort of more idiot proof is what I would call a permutation test. And you've had to do a little, explain with them a little bit in your homeworks. I want to go through how is it that permutation tests really work, okay? So because this I think is often a useful thing. So what is the idea of a permutation test? Well, if we have a hypothesis that, let's say, one gender is smarter than the other gender, okay, then it should be that if we had that, that, that the, uh, let's say, the size of the difference, let's think, how would we tell whether or not um, if there was a certain number of men we saw, a certain number of women we saw, we had their average IQs, how significant is the difference between that? One way we could tell is say, okay, the difference between the means was 0 0.03. Now, suppose then I took a random sample. I randomly assigned IQs to people, okay? And now I take the, of these new people, these simulated people, I took the IQs of the men and I took the IQs of the women. There is going to be a difference here. The question is, if, if the original difference between men and women is a real difference, the difference in that mean should be bigger than the difference in the random sample. And the idea of the permutation test is that we are going to go repeat many, many times this shuffling and see where we rank in the distribution of this. Any questions about that? Okay. So in some sense, what's going to drive a p-value by a permutation test is we need to have a statistic which is measuring what we think is interesting about the difference between the populations. In what we, the example we've been talking about, it's the IQ difference between one gender and another. Okay? Uh, it could be the, the level of correlation between two things. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so the picture of how a permutation test works is the following. This is how I understand it. Here's an example where we were looking at, uh, is there a difference in heights between men and women? And this, in general, I think everyone will agree on, right? That generally speaking, men are taller than women. So here was a data set where we have a bunch of people who are women, and we have their height color-coded and length-coded. Does everybody get this idea? The size of this bar is a function of how, how tall they are, and the color sort of goes along with uh, what their height is, right? So if we look at this distribution, the women here look shorter than the men. Does everybody see that? The men have, there's, there's men who are much taller than the tallest women. There's more blueness among the men than there is among the women, okay? Based on this, it would be not unreasonable looking at this data to conclude that men probably are taller than women on average, right? Now, how would we prove this? What we're going to do now is take these heights and randomly shuffle them, keep the women and the men, their, their positions the same, randomly shuffle the heights between everybody, and then if I now sort each distribution by height, does everybody see now in the synthetic women, we have a lot more taller people than we did in the real women. Does everybody see that? 
If we computed the, uh, the height difference, the average height of the men, ver simulated men versus the simulated women, the height difference between these two populations are presumably smaller than the height difference in the real population. Does everybody see that? And so what we're going to do is the following kind of an idea. We're going to perform those random permutations a thousand times, ten thousand times, a hundred thousand times, till we get tired of doing it. Okay? And for each one of those permutations, we're going to get a statistic of what was the height difference of the men versus the women in that random sample. So we get a distribution here. We can think of it as a histogram if we bucket it, okay, or a sorted order if we didn't bucket it, okay. We can take all the, in all the examples, we can, for every one of those random permutations, we are going to get a statistic for height of simulated men minus height of simulated women, right? And we're then going to look where does the real observed phenomena sit in that distribution. If the real distribution of difference between men and women was here, well, that's in the middle of the random samples. That's a, yes, there's a difference. <coughs> it's not zero, but it's not a big enough difference to be very interesting. Does everybody see that? If there's a big difference, the random, uh, the, the real data should lie at one end of the distribution, okay? And in particular, the p-value we're going to get is how many of the random examples were more extreme than the real example divided by the number of ra what random examples. What fraction of the random samples were more extreme than the observation? And that's what's going to give us the confidence that this observation is a real observation. Any questions about that? Yes? What are we plotting here? We are plotting the x-axis is the difference between, let's say, we, again, let's get back at our example here where we're trying to tell whether men and women have significantly different height, right? The statistic that we're going to be computing is Let's say the mean difference in height of the men minus the mean difference of the mean height of the women, right? If they were the same, it would be zero. If the men were taller, it would be positive, and the women were taller, it would be negative, right? So what we're going to do now is randomly permute the, the, the values, okay, among the same number of men and women, okay? And now we've got a fake distribution of random men and random women. Based on this, we can, com we, we can look at the two populations and compute the same statistic on this new population. Here, the height of men minus the height of women. What we're getting over here, x is going to be the difference in height between men and women. Y is the frequency with which we observe that in our random samples, okay? And if we bucket it like this, we would expect there's probably a bell-shaped difference for many statistics, for most reasonable statistics, okay? And the question is, do we lie outside the realm of what is reasonable or not? What fraction of the random samples exceed what we were seeing, okay? And if it's a very, very small number, a small fraction, then that gives us confidence that there is a, the difference we observe is a real difference. Yeah? Well, you use the sort of order of times the 109. Like they're saying if, if there, there are four things larger, then you're just four over n, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so what, what the other question was, I had this as a histogram. But another way to look at it is recognize that, again, for any given permutation, we are getting a value. What was the height of the difference between the simulated men? This is delta men minus women. You know, delta men minus the women height. Right? And for any given sample, we're going to get a value of that. Right? For any given random sample. 
For another random sample, we might get this and 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 this. Does everybody see that? Now, if my real data was over here, what is the significance to the observation that I say there is a real difference? There is probability this happened was two out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Two out of fourteen, that would be one out of seven. That's not a you know point zero five thing, right? That's not enough to really convince me at this point, right? But if I had a lot more random samples in here, then I'll give one over here, the fraction that's above it, when the fraction that's above it is small enough, that is a sign that it's probably meaningful. Okay? Any questions about that? So this is how we do a permutation test. Okay? Any questions about it? Okay? So what do I like to do about what I would think about, again, it's a question of what is your level of suspicion. You're telling me I have a small number of data. Let's say I'm comparing, you know, uh, height against, you know, um, IQ or something like this, right? And what you're telling me is there was a correlation. You had, had you know, 10 people in it, and the, uh, the correlation was 0.4, okay? Do I think this is, how much should I be impressed by this correlation? If what I did was, um, again, this was originally here, I had a, a 10 points, 1 through 10, where I had a height, and let's say the height went from, you know, something here to, to something there, and I had an IQ, right? The observed correlation was 0.4. If I randomly permute these guys, and now compare the randomly permuted values, the correlation between this and this, I'm going to get a different number. Does everybody see that? If I do that a hundred times, I'm going to see this was point, this was point 0.4 was the observed correlation I cared about. Maybe I did it a hundred times, three times, the correlation was greater than point 0.4. The rest of the time it was less. That fraction gives me some kind of a measure of what is the confidence that this, this um, correlation happened by chance, right? So you're telling me that if I have 10 of these guys and they're all stacked up here, yes. okay? But by, by my model, by, by my model, I'm not worried about it, okay? Because it is again, it, it it's hard to be the extreme one here, right? And you know, in this case, we're not really caring about what the distribution is. We're only caring about what the place of the rank of it is, okay? So I agree with you. If I did this and I saw a lot of guys stacking up next to this, I might get nervous. But that's not the, what, what, what a permutation test is going to worry about. Okay? Any questions? Yes? But if you do it in this case, now, for example, if I had five of these guys to the right of point four, rank higher, yeah. then should I be suspicious? Well, it depends. What is the ratio of five to the total number of points? Okay? If you tell me, oh my God, I've got five random samples that are bigger than this. Well, if I did a billion random samples, that doesn't you know, I'm not discouraged by that, right? Because five over a billion is a very small number. If I did 10 random samples and five came up to the left of it, then yes, I'm going to be nervous, right? In general, what I want to know is, is the fraction of the examples that are above it relatively small, you know, is that a small enough number for me to be impressed by 
how strong the co correlation is. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Usually the notion of impressed by the correlation, if you're doing one of these things, would be 0 0.05. That's a common point where I say, am I impressed? But if I've done a lot of these, maybe I need to use a Bonferrani correction. I need to have a, a finer level of significance here. Any questions? Yeah. When you do the p test, the random numbers that you're generating or like the random sampling, that should be primed to be in the same range as the data that you're trying to find out, basically. Because let's say the, the number variations are like in the order of 10, like 10, 11, 12, and the prime, the random generation is between 0 and 1. That's well, the random generation recognize, but the randomness is the random permutation of the values. It's not that I'm constructing random numbers from a normal distribution or anything like that. In the permutation test, I am taking my, the data you gave me. I am taking this thing that gave you the observation you cared about. And I am now randomly permuting one side of the, <coughs> of the numbers. And I'm saying, if I scramble it up, do I still see an effect? That's really what this is asking about. Okay, does that answer your question? It has to do with random permutations of things. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, <clears throat> so what is the idea here? Typically you're going to perform, let's say, at least a thousand random permutations, okay? Depends upon how many you can run before it gets to be tedious, right? Typically, what we will do is per permute the values of a field, okay, uh, 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 across records. So maybe we would, um, what you call it? Uh, in, in this case, basically, uh, keep hold one side of the value. If we're trying to say, is this variable correlated with that variable? Take the y values and permute them, okay? So now x gets 1 at random from this pool. Right? Okay? In the case of, of time series, often you're interested in you have a time series here. This is sales. And this is how many salespeople you have put in the field. Right? Is it that the number of sales you're getting is a function of time? Okay? It depends with this thing. Maybe what you would do is randomly scramble. E each one of these points is you know, sales versus the number of employees, right? If we have n pairs like this, randomly permute these values. And now we create a fake instance. And how does the effect look, the correlation between them, the, dis the, the mean shift between them, okay? Any questions? Okay. So typically what we want to do is, um, what you call it, I, again, is to see how impressive is our result relative to random permutations of the data. Any questions? Now one phenomena that often is the case is that uh, sometimes when you do an experiment like this, you train models on random data and it does very well. If so, that's usually a sign you've got a problem, right? If you're getting good results from your model, and then you compare it, train it on random data, and you get an equally good model, okay, that's a sign that you've got a problem. Any questions? Okay. So I like permutation tests because I can see them and understand what's going on. But there are a few caveats that you have to understand here. Basically, what a permutation test is going to do is give you the probability that you saw your data given your hypothesis, right? It's a question of what is the probability that I got a correlation this good, okay? I'm assuming the correlation that's this good, what's the likelihood I would have gotten a data set with correlation that good? Really what I'm usually interested in is what is the probability that my hypothesis is true given the data? which is not exactly the same thing. 
Okay, so if you talk to a real statistician, real statisticians get unhappy at permutation tests. Okay, because they're not really measuring necessarily the same thing that you would want a statistical test to measure. It's a question of how unusual is your observation, right? Now, of course, you've had the observation before you do the permutation test to show that it's interesting, okay? Any questions? The other thing to, that, that, that's true with permutation tests, that, 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 that means you have to be careful about them. Suppose, let's say, that there really is a difference between, it's, it's unusual that this data would give me, um, what you call it, a, a correlation this high. If I ran a million random samples, okay, instead of a thousand, my fraction of samples above it may very well be much lower than when I ran it with a thousand, right? If I ran it with a billion random samples, my fraction of, of observations that happened by chance above this might still be only once, right? If it was really an outlier observation, so obvious that's why I was doing it, do you see that the more random samples you run, the fraction, the chance that this happened by chance, okay, is going to get smaller and smaller. Does everybody see that? But it doesn't necessarily mean that your conclusion is getting stronger and stronger the more you run it, right? The question of whether or not this, the relationship between men and women is real, okay, isn't really getting more true the more random samples you're running. You keep the computer running for five days or ten days on it, right? So you, you've got to be, you know, think about, re recognize that it's easy to get an artificially high p-value by constructing an infinite number of, of permutations. Any questions? Any questions about that? Okay. Now, how do you construct random permutations? This is an interesting problem. Again, it's an algorithmic -y problem. One way to construct a random permutation from things is basically as follows. You know that you have random number generators, and you can generate a random number from 1 to n, and random integer from 1 to n easily. You get random number generators typically give you a number between 0 and 1, right? You divide that by n, it'll give you an integer between, a random integer between 0 and 1, right? One way to construct a random in, uh, number is to basically take pairs of elements. Start from the first element. Take a random number from 1 to n, let's say, and swap the first element with whatever the random, if you come a random number comes up with 7, swap 1 with the 7th element. Then maybe get two other random numbers. Swap the 19th one with the 96th. Does everybody kind of get the idea that if you do enough random swaps, you should mix up the elements uniformly? Does that kind of make sense? That said, here are two algorithms for generating permutations at random. And one of them is right and one of them is wrong. Okay? Can you see what the difference is? What is the difference here? What, I mean, what you're saying, what, what's different is that here we have an i, right? This is first initial a, a sub i to i, so it's a number of 1 through n is my random, per, my initial permutation. The first one says swap the ith element with, with the, an element randomly chosen from i to n. Another one says swap the ith element with a random element chosen from 1 to n. Okay? Does everybody see what, it, what the difference is? Which of these generates random permutations and which one doesn't? Yeah? Okay, let's take a vote. That's usually the way that you do it. Who says the first one generates the random permutation? Who here says the second one generates the random permutation? Okay. Now, how do we tell which is right? Okay. Now, the easiest thing to do is to do a permutation test. Okay? And suppose, let's say, we do run both of these algorithms on permutations. Okay? We construct, let's say, all per random permutations of size 4. Okay? There's 4 factorial or 24 random permutations of size 4. Permutations of size four. The first algorithm generates them. This is showing we did a million of these. 
The first one generates that we had done them almost uniformly, right? The second one shows that there was a, a fairly serious bias. Some of them, per, certain permutations got generated eight times as much as other ones, right? So this is, should be a lesson to us about random sampling, that relatively small samples of things that look like what they're doing can have a big impact. Generating things uniformly at random is not as easy as it sees. Okay? So the truth is that it's the first one that generates random permutations. Why does it generate random permutations? The argument that I would use is, let's look at the first position. The first position of our permutation, the first element, which is 1 according to the initialization, is going to be randomly swapped with any one of them equally likely, right? And then we're never going to allow you to change a sub 1 again. Does everybody see that? So a sub 1 is right. It's any one's equally likely. And by sort of recur, you know, by induction, okay, the same thing is going to be true for every other permutation. Okay? Any questions? So the moral is this is how you generate random permutations. And that random generation is a subtle thing. Any questions? Okay? And again, this basically, the key notion here is that random generation is a subtle thing. When you are generating things at random, you should do a permutation test, or you should at least plot the distributions to see that you're right. When you are doing a random from i to n, doesn't that <coughs> No, any one of those elements from i to n has an equally likely chance to have been shoved into the first position. Right? So the first thing swap, one is going to go someplace. It can go any place equally likely, and that's going to take. So yeah, so half the elements are going to come from the second half of the, uh, you know, of, of, uh, from n over 2 to n. Okay? So in fact, that generates it uniformly at random. Any questions? What's another way to generate random permutations if you don't want to be clever like this? And you have ra a real random number generator. Any ideas? What some people would do is they'd take the numbers 1 through n, they generate random reals, n random reals, and then sort these things by this key. Does everybody kind of get that idea? that you could say this one was 0 0.7314, 0 0.2176, 0 0.973. Does everybody see that? If I generated these random reals and now I sort them, carrying these integers with them, right, that should generate a random permutation also. OK, any questions? But the, sort of, but the, uh, the, the swap algorithm is much nicer. Any questions? OK, good. And so this problem that, we, that, that, that happens, I, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly now, but uh, recognize that there is a real problem that we have when we're working with distributions and doing random sampling of how do we draw random samples uniformly at random, right? Suppose we want to pick, we have a random number generator that given an I, you know, a, a range will give us a random real in a particular range. 